Welcome to Manaway Center Christian Church. We are a community seeking to have open minds, open hearts, open arms, and building community in a very fragmented world. We want to welcome everyone who is in the house today, everyone who's online, and please greet with your neighbors. I have a few announcements this morning. Today is 4C Sunday, and um, I don't see too many kids, so I think we'll be collecting 4C's offerings at the back of the church. And it's also, I have an announcement for loaves and fishes, that we need three more people for dessert, and if you can do that, if you'd call Carolyn Newell. And then the last thing is our mission trip is, uh, sends, sends off next week. And we're still looking for donations for that. And if there's any non-perishables available, um, you can actually put those by the communion table. And you can donate next week, too, because they will be in church next, week's, uh, next week morning. Now, my opening scripture, I'm going to read from Palm 77, chapters 1 and 2, verses 11 to 13. I cry aloud to God aloud to God that he may hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. I will call to mind the deeds of the Lord. I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work and muse on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is so great as our God? And now let's have our response. With friends and strangers, with family and neighbors, we gather. With faith reaching out to touch, with hearts straining to trust, we hope. With word and wonder, with silence and song, we wait. Our opening hymn is Love Divine, All Things Excelling.
Good morning. All right, so this afternoon at noon, I'll be on my way to Camp Whitewood up in Windsor for the week until Friday night I come back. Um, this year, however, will be different from years past because I've taken on the responsibility of being a camp counselor. The theme we chose this year is through the ages, so each day is like a different time period, you know, theme. Uh, there's like prehistoric, Wild West, 70s, and then the future. Um, my cabin is Wild West themed. It's super cute. I like made so many decorations. Kind of went overboard, but <laughs> it's all right. Um, I also have like 10 or 11 10 year old girls in my cabin. <laughs> because of this, my co counselor and I have been trying to think of savvy ways to make things easier for them. For instance, we bought each of them a reusable shopping bag for them to take their clothes and their toiletries back and forth from the showers. Um, however, I didn't just think of this idea out of the blue. In fact, my first year of camp when I was just eight years old, I dropped my pajamas on the floor of the shower the first night, and I had to go to bed wet. <laughs> um, therefore, I did not shower the rest of the week. <laughs> um, but <laughs> because of one bad experience I had, I didn't want the other girls to go through it and discourage them from taking showers as well. <laughs> um, Another thing we came up with was bringing a tarp for their shoes to go under at night um, because when I was a camper, all our shoes had to stay outside the cabin. Um, obviously, you don't want your cabin to stink, so that was reasonable, but, you know, it would rain. It rained, like, three nights, I think, so I had, like, wet shoes the whole week. Um, so I didn't, you know, so we brought a tarp so that their shoes will stay dry. And then finally, to accommodate for the kids that don't have a wide variety of food that they like to eat, I have brought some extra snacks. Um, and water bottles for them to take to their sessions throughout the day. Um, but the idea behind this is that learning from my mistakes, I can make this week more enjoyable for each of them without them even knowing it. If there's anything important I've learned in my 17 years, it's that you can be having the best time making friends, partying, whatever the case may be, but it takes one bad experience to ruin it. Uh, we will now accept our tithes, gifts, and offerings.
Dear God, thank you for our mistakes and failures that we can learn from to benefit not only ourselves in the future, but others. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, this is, could be good news or bad news, but I've got a children's sermon that I wrote, so we're going to listen to it. <laughs> so pretend you're all kids. So good morning, everyone. How are you all? So I got a couple questions. Did anybody come to church riding their bikes? Hmm. Hey, did anybody come to church on a horse? No. Well, how did you get here? Okay, so when you were coming to church, did you notice how many cars are actually on the road? A lot. Maybe not so many out here, but I'll tell you what, I have to interject. In Chicago, nobody wants to go there to drive. <laughs> They drive like maniacs, first of all. So how do you think all these cars keep from crashing into each other? Because there are rules you need to follow to keep everybody safe. You have to drive on the right, follow speed limits, no texting while driving. If everyone followed the rules, we'd all be safe. Did you know, as Christians, we have rules too. Does anyone know what our Christian rules are? What are they called? Now you guys ought to know this. Oh, oh Everett, thank you. <laughs> the Ten Commandments, you're right. And we have to keep, they are for us to keep out of trouble. But mostly to show us how to be kind to each other. These rules are something we can all easily do it's good to have rules, I think, especially ones that God gives us because he loves us. And can we pray together? Thank you for giving us your rules. As mentioned in the Bible, and help us to keep our lives Focused on, you, focused on you, and in kindness for each other. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus name pray. Amen. Thank you for humoring me there. I wrote this thing after coming back from vacation last night, so I was going to use it. And now, if we could pray together. Almighty God, you are a gracious Father. Clothed in majesty, you are mighty, yet you save us with mercy. Almighty God, you are an exquisite creator with hands that carve out beauty you are author of life, yet you give us such freedom. Almighty God, you know each of us intimately. Your life is full of love, yet you watch over us in our weakness and guide us daily. Prince of Peace, we draw near to you and drink in the promise of eternity. Lord of Peace, we walk with you and seek your guidance as we learn to be more loving. Lord of peace, in your sanctuary we are safe, safe to let down our guard and dwell in your truth. Risen Lord, you came for the needy, the poor, the oppressed, the forsaken, and those that society has forgotten. Risen Lord, your life renews our hearts from within. Thank you that we carry your promise of forgiveness. Risen Lord, we ask for your spirit to work through us as we minister to the world and share your love with all. Almighty God, Prince of Peace, Risen Lord, 
we dedicate our lives to you. Amen. As a child, I was raised in the Baptist Church in Garrettsville, and only those that were baptized were able to take communion. So at the age of nine, I took Jesus as my savior by means of submersion by Pastor Willie. I don't know why I'm crying. This is a good one, a happy one. We didn't take communion weekly at the Baptist Church, church only on certain occasions, and I remember being beyond excited walking into church one Sunday and seeing the golden plates on the table knowing that today was going to be the day that I got to take my first communion. I am now just shy of 46, and I still get excited to partake in this extraordinary meal every week. I know whatever storm is going on in my life, it will settle down for just a few minutes and let me find that inner peace. And once I find that inner peace, I am able to leave this beautiful building and navigate through my storm. I find it sad that not all Christians take communion, communion weekly. I am sure if I took the time to research it, there's a reason why they don't, and that's okay. However, have you ever attended a church other than our own that said, you can't take the bread or the wine because you believe in Jesus in a different way? Okay, maybe they didn't say it quite in so many words, but that's how I interpreted it. And it was confirmed later from a friend who attended that church. They said, well, certainly you cannot take our communion because you don't go here. Hmm. Well, thank goodness what I really wanted to say did not come out of my mouth. I have mentioned it before. One of the biggest reasons I chose Manaway Center Christian Church when I was church shopping for my family was hearing Len Malott say for the first time, all are welcome at the table, and all means all. For me personally, it is one of the most profound statements I have ever heard in any church. Jesus set the table for all of us. I feel in my heart he doesn't mind if some of us have been baptized or not. He gave us 10 simple rules to follow. He simply asked for us to believe in him. And he will always show us the grace, no matter how we choose to believe in him. He wants us here. He will always welcome you however you come, happy, sad, lost, or found. My only hope is that all can find the same peace that I, the peace and love at this table that I do. Our communion hymn is number 398. <laughs> Please join me in an attitude of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this special time in my faith, a time when I must come before you and closely examine myself, and in doing so, I am to eat the bread and drink the cup. I thank you for helping me find inner peace and providing tools to help me navigate the storms that you have strategically placed in my life. For at the end of every storm is usually a rainbow. May we be forever grateful for your love and grace, and may we always remember the prayer that you taught us to say, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had blessed it, he shared it with the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. And in a like manner, after supper, he took the cup. And after again blessing the cup, he shared it with the disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink ye all of it.
Okay, here we go. You're looking at your amateur hour right now. The scripture reading is from Exodus 20, verses 12 through 16. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Honor your father and your mother, so that all your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. At the start of this message, I'm sure I'll be repeating Nancy a little, but had to give myself some context in order to get going. The first question I had was why God gave us the Ten Commandments. They aren't legal laws. We actually don't have to follow them, although most Christians do. But they were given to us just as a loving parent lays down ground rules for his child to follow, to lead a safe and successful life. God the Father gave us the Ten Commandments to help us to lead our best lives with regard to our relationship with him and our relationship with each other. Since the Garden of Eden, man has rebelled against God. To help free humanity from the likelihood of our sinning and to help us to lead our best lives, God handed down the Ten Commandments as a sort of code for moral lives to help us live. We should not allow this code to be followed out of fear or guilt, but rather as signposts that point us to the straight and narrow path of righteousness. The path is clearly marked, but stray we will. I am going to be talking about five of the last commandments that deal with how we form and maintain our relationship with each other. Here we go, so butter, buckle up, buttercups. <laughs> the fifth commandment is honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that your Lord, your God, is giving you. This simply means to do as one is told. To honor means to respect and love. And this will only happen if both parents and children put the other's interests above their own. That is, if they submit to each other. So my question is this. How do you honor your parents if they are not honorable? Not everyone has stellar parents. And mine bordered on abusive. Oddly, while both parents occasionally did not honor the four of us, I dearly loved my mother. I wanted nothing more than to please her. Throughout my life, especially at significant times in my life, I have missed her a lot. My dad, on the other hand, was a different story. I was afraid of my dad. Now, I am not going into all the gory stories about what Liz Meeker is the quirky person she is. But suffice to say, I have long struggled with the honor your parents' commandment. As a Christian, I am asked to follow this commandment. But how? I think it's okay to honor the role that both of my parents played in my life. After all, they were my parents. I focus on the happy memories and remember that it is right and expected that I do no harm. And it's an important note here, to them or to me. It's okay to make space, stand alone, and still show respect. The sixth commandment is thou shall not murder. The commandment is explained 
If you suffer being Christian, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. I probably could get nailed on that one. (laughs) Just ask my kids. We can suffer as a Christian, and as we already know, Jesus will be with us all the way. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. That comes from Matthew 5, verse 16. Now this commandment, also in the New Revised Standard Version, refers to murder specifically. If you swat a fly, you're okay. If you are a hunter, that's acceptable. The commandment asks, though, that we not kill each other. I watched a video about the do not murder commandment. This one really interested me, I think, a lot because of the times that we live in. There are three questions to ask before you pull the trigger, hit someone with a hammer, etc. What is your direct action? What is your direct intention? And what is your direct result? If someone has invaded your home, your direct action is probably your safety. Direct intent is again yours and your family's safety. And direct result is that either the guy ran out of the house or he is laying on the floor with a huge lump on his head. All three questions do not result in murder. Now we all need to think twice about killing anyone, but this helped me at least understand the terminology. And as I write this, we are a little more than two weeks away from the massacre in Uvalde. I've been working on this for two weeks, so it's probably more closer to three now. I almost don't know what to say about this. Does it make sense that God would hand us a commandment about not killing, expecting to have it ignored the way it is? Is this commandment open to exceptions? Like, it's okay to kill if you're mentally ill. It's okay to kill if you can be sold a gun two days before the event. Or it's okay to kill if you're a politician that cares more for your voter base than small children. I know I am being slightly ridiculous here, but something has to be done so we can honor this commandment. Our first response in any life-threatening situation should not be to reach for our weapons. Personally, I would probably be so frightened I would shoot my foot off. I am going to close on this tough commandment with a thought that a friend asked. What if Jesus came to earth right now? What if he came to rewrite this commandment? How would it be rewritten? And lastly, can you see or sense his tears? We are failing our Jesus. The seventh commandment is you shall not commit adultery. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Um, This came from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Christians must have a great respect for marriage vows. Love between husband and wife must be nurtured throughout life. Marriage partners must make sure their love runs deep enough to affect their hospitality, sympathy, fidelity, and contentment. I also viewed the Hebrew definition of adultery. I I didn't think that was all there could be. So it is described, the Hebrew definition is described differently, but there's much the same players, but there are two exceptions. One adultery in scripture is idolatry or apostasy from the true God, from Jeremiah 3, verse 8. I wish I had bet my husband five bucks on this one because I would have one more gallon of gas (laughs) for having done that. I had thought adultery might be turning away from Christianity, 
more specifically of Christ. The definition of apostasy is, wait for it, the rejection of Christianity by someone who formerly was a Christian and or who wishes to be administratively removed from a formal registry of church members. The second difference, and this one really surprised me, is that among ancient naturalists, the grafting of trees is considered adultery or an unnatural union. I thought that was a big surprise. The eighth commandment is thou shalt not steal. And this is from Ephesians 4, verses 28. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Now, stealing comes in many formats. Shoplifting, fraud, robbing someone, insider trading. And, but here is one that is easy to get caught on, especially during the summer. Once, I took all three kids to Kent Roosevelt Pool to swim. I don't even know if they have public swimming there anymore, but they did. I think at the time it cost a dollar per kid if you were a Kent resident. It was free if you lived in Kent. Oh, so as we went through the turnstile, the high school kids said to me, so you're from Kent, right? And I honestly didn't give it a thought. I just said, no, we're from Manaway. <laughs> I realized the look on the high school boy's face was, wow, we got a doozy here. And I, I did afterwards feel like, oh, duh, that was kind of dumb. But then I shortly realized what a good message that was for our kids. I mean, after all, they knew where they lived. <laughs> Honesty has always been something that I value very highly. And by God's grace and more than a little prodding from their parents, they have been chased around the block by their mother specifically, and they are honest as well. Good thing for all of you since I'm the treasurer. <laughs> the ninth commandment is my personal favorite. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. This is from Exodus 12, verse 16. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of the creator. This commandment is widely understood as a moral imperative by Jewish, Catholic, and Protestant scholars. It was definitely a top moral imperative in the Meeker house. I have a gift for spotting a liar. Just ask my kids. They all have three, two of them had brown eyes, one of them has uh, green. Not one of them can lie. Brown eyed people just don't pull it off. But in reality, there are a couple things that are the important lessons here. Truthfulness and trust. Having both of these qualities is part of God's plan to love each other and be good neighbors. Well, we made it. Phew. I have studied a lot, and I learned more. God's hope and wish for all of us is to love one another. These Ten Commandments, while seemingly simple rules to love by, are a tapestry of who we are to be with one another. Soldiers from opposing sides found it 50 years after they fought against each other. The hope is that for son and daughter to find reconciliation with his or her father, perhaps the homeless man will no longer covet his neighbor's house when he finds a home of his own to live in. Whatever the cause or case may be, God gave the commandments a long time ago so we could be a people living for and within the kingdom as one body, fully loving and peaceful. May you all find wholeness and peace 
as you live in worship with the gift God has given us called the Ten Commandments. Go in peace. May the world not touch our hearts right now. Help us to do what we need to do for mankind out there. And remember to be courageous and peaceful in our walk. Amen. Thank you.